الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam respected imam respected haji ibrahim brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh i'm very happy to be here in kajang in Kuala Lumpur tonight I was always told that Kajang is famous for Rojak <laughs> Sati okay Sati so we are in Kajang in Kuala Lumpur tonight and we begin the subject of marriage in Islam which cannot be completed in one lecture Tonight, in fact, we're going to be looking at marriage in Islam and in Dajjal's modern godless world. Some people are going to be offended right away that we describe the modern world as Dajjal's modern world. But we came to that conclusion based on our study of a subject that you all know, Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, or otherwise known as Islamic eschatology. Based on our study, of Ilmu Akhiru Zaman, we have come to the conclusion that Dajjal is the mastermind who has brought this modern age into existence. Those who wish to defer with us have the freedom to do that. And our purpose is to compare what Islam has to say on the subject of marriage with what Dajjal has been saying and shouting from the mountain tops from CNN and Al Jazeera and all the rest, the New York Times and newspapers and radio and television. What do they have? to say on marriage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in surah al-nahl of the Quran the surah entitled the B surah number 16 and he says and we have sent down the book the Quran sent it down on thee O Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam that this Quran might explain all things 
So when we want to know what is the reality, the hakika of this modern age, we don't go to the United Nations for the answer, do we? No. We don't go to the New Straits Times for the answer, do we? Huh? When we want to know what is the reality of the world in which we live today, this strange world, it is to the Quran that we must go. Let me share with you before we address marriage. Let me share with you for one little moment what is the modern age. And let me know whether you have an answer that explains it. Two thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expelled Banu Israel from the Holy Land. Al-Ardul Muqaddasa. Today they call it Palestine. But in the Quran, Al-Ardul Muqaddasa of the Holy Land. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then placed a ban on them that they could never return. Tabule could never return. <laughs> they could come back as tourists. But you could never return on, to reclaim the Holy Land as you own until a certain time arrives, which is Akhiru Zaman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the state of Israel. Yeah. Today, Two thousand years later, the Holy Land has been liberated for the Jews. So we ask, did this happen by accident? <laughs> or is there something which explains? Today, two thousand years later, the Jews have returned to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. We ask you, did this happen by accident? We have to raise our voices sometime because they don't hear us. They don't hear us. They preach Islam and they teach all the subjects of Islam. But they don't answer us. Today, 2,000 years later, they have returned to reclaim the Holy Land as their own. And we are asking again and again and again, did this happen by accident? Or is there something which explains it? Today, 2,000 years later, a state of Israel has been restored in the Holy Land. And we are asking, is this by accident? Why can't you answer us? What is the reality of the world today? Why don't you answer us? We ask you one more time from Kajang. We ask the scholars of Islam, and we've been asking, but no answer, no answer. Today that state of Israel has grown and grown and grown and grown, until it has become a superpower in a brief period of time. A nuclear-armed Israel. And that Israel controls the United States of America, which is the ruling state in the world. And that Israel is now poised to replace the United States. Read this book. It was written 
10 years ago? Yes. 2002, nine years ago? Jerusalem in the Quran, many have read it already. This is an introduction to Islamic eschatology, this book, Akhiru Zaman. Alhamdulillah, we now have it in Bahasa. Jerusalem, di dalam Quran. Our answer is that this is not happening by accident. Our answer is that this is Akhiru Zaman. Our answer is that Dajjal is the mastermind. This is our answer. If we are wrong, then come forward and say so. And then tell us what is the right answer. Having given you that introduction, I can now speak with a certain amount of surety and confidence. The Dajjal controls the modern age. And so when we present the subject of marriage in Islam, we're not doing so in a vacuum. We have to present the subject of marriage in Islam in the context of the rival view of marriage, which is coming from Dajjal's godless modern age. There are those who are going to be very uncomfortable with this lecture. But you and I are not going to be uncomfortable. Because we are on the camp of Islam. And they are in the camp of Dajjal. Allah speaks in the ayah quoted by Haji Ibrahim. Which is the first ayah in Surah An-Nisa. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'ad a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Ya ayyuhal nas, ittaku rabbakum alladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida. Fear your Rabb who created you from a single nafs. Wa khalak minha Zawjaha. And from that single nafs, he created its mate, its spouse. Wabatha min huma. And from these two, the male and the female. I don't think there is any way other than this to understand it. The male and the female وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً So Allah has introduced us to marriage. That the male and the female come together. And from the coming together of the male and the female, you have something, I don't know the Bahasa word in English, procreation. Huh? Children are born from the male and the female. And so marriage in Islam is marriage between the male and the female. And uh, the primary purpose of the marriage, as described in this ayah, is for children to be born. And that mankind could therefore survive and grow. This is under attack today. The Jal says no. Dajjal is contesting this view of the Quran. And Dajjal uses every trick in the book, including the IMF, including the IMF, including the World Bank, 
including the United Nations resolutions, to say no, that marriage does not have to be between a male and a female. And so the modern godless age says that marriage can be between a man and another man and between a woman and another woman. Every single government in the world will eventually have to submit as they have submitted all of them and very quickly with the passage of anti-terrorism legislation. We order it, you have to do it. And so every government in the world will eventually have to enact legislation to permit the marriage of a man with a man. And so we begin by warning this audience that from the time you hear a voice in your midst speaking out and defending the marriage of a man with another man, you must know that you are under attack from Dajjal. You cannot, you can defeat him in arguments, yes, that's what we're going to be doing tonight. But he will eventually win the world. And you will have to protect your faith. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, that people will have to flee from Dajjal. Flee from Dajjal. He said about the fitna of Dajjal. And fitna is a test, a trial. That it would be the greatest fitna that mankind will experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day. When you have the greatest test and trial, you need the best scholars of Islam. This age has to produce the best Islamic scholarship. If this age is to respond to the greatest tests and trials ever, and the fact that Islamic scholarship has not been able to answer these questions that I began with, they have not been able to answer this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, is an indication of the pathetic state of affairs. Let us examine the thesis of marriage between the male and the female in Islam. And we want to begin by asking, what is it to be a male? What is gender? What is the Bahasa for gender? Jagdina. Jagdina. What is Jagdina? What is gender? Only in Islam, and to some extent in Judaism. Allah is free from gender. Allah is neither male nor female. Allah created both the male and the female. But Allah is neither male nor female. Laysa kamithlihi shay. 
in Hinduism and we are not speaking disrespectfully you not only have male gods you also have female goddesses Lakshmi is a female goddess in Buddhism while you do not have the clearly defined God in Buddhism from the original Hinayan Buddhism the Mahayan is different Buddha is worshipped as God and Buddha is not female Buddha is a man in Christianity Jesus is worshipped as God and Jesus is not a woman Jesus is a man and so God is male and therefore in these religions it is the male who defines the female it is the male who says what a female is because God is male but only in Islam Allah is neither male nor female and so Allah defines who is male and what is female and there is nothing discriminatory in that I was fond of saying when I lived in the United States because I left the United States after 9-11 I addressed my American audiences and I said to them if God is a man that's bad news for women and some of them were very uncomfortable with that and so I found in the United States that they started to change their tune and the new American definition of God is that God is both a man and a woman did you hear that? God is both a man and a woman and so in Islam Allah who is neither male nor female he defines who is a male and who is a female but while Allah is neither male nor female notice he always refers to himself as who Allah notice who Allah he is Allah never says he Allah she is Allah no he always defines himself using the masculine gender never using the feminine gender although he is not male and so we ask the question why is it that the male is superior to the female couldn't be couldn't be because Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said let me see if I have it with me no he said all of mankind will appear before Allah oh no no I have it I have it, I have it. <laughs> all of mankind will appear before Allah on judgment day men as well as women as equal in his sight as equal in his sight can you see it as the teeth of a comb huh? bullet so that disposes that disposes of the spurious and invalid argument that the male is superior to the female <laughs> so why does Allah refer to himself in the masculine gender not only that philosophy of gender in Islam is very interesting because Allah created the angels al malaika and they are free from gender they are not male or female the angels are not male or female hmm? 
But in Surah Al-Najm of the Quran, you know, Allah always give names to the angels with a masculine names. There's one angel whose name is Jibra'il or Gabriel. Another one whose name is Mikael or Michael. Israfil. Israel. They're always masculine names, although the angels are not male. But in Surah to Najm of the Quran, he says that it is those who disbelieve in Allah. They are the ones who give feminine names to the angels. The kuffar. Hmm? Meaning it is haram to give a feminine name to the angel. And so we ask why this is happening. This is the philosophy of gender in Islam. We have more to ask. And Allah is never unjust to any servant of his. A woman came to the Prophet one day and asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, revelation is coming down in the Quran. And Allah is always addressing the men, always addressing, how come he not addressing us? And so Allah sent down the revelation. Say to the believing men and the believing women. And say to the men who are pious and the women who are pious and the men who perform salat and the women who perform salat and the men who give zakat and the women who give zakat and the men who fast and the women who fast and men and men and men and men. Repeating 10, 12 times. Indicating thereby, no, I am not discriminating in favor of the male and against the female, no. Allah is just. So that disposed of the argument that Allah was favoring the male. And then Allah sent prophets. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said that he sent 124 thousand prophets and all the prophets were rijal men not one was a woman not one and we ask the question why is there some profound message which is being sent concerning the philosophy of gender of late, of course, there is a particular Sufi group, one Sufi group, who have been, who have been advancing the thesis that Maryam, alayhi salam, the mother of Nabi Isa, alayhi salam, is a Nabiya. <laughs> have you heard of it? <laughs> Nabiya. But that is a fringe movement. We can. We don't, we don't need to bother about it. The followers of that movement will probably listen to this lecture. We don't mean to disrespect you, but that is misguidance if you don't mind. Islam comes from the Quran. And it comes from Nabi Muhammad Islam. So be careful. Why did Allah send 124,000 prophets all as men and not one as a woman? Is it mean? Is it because women are intellectually inferior? That's rubbish. That's the only word I can use for it. That women are intellectually inferior to men. That's rubbish. Is it that women are spiritually inferior to men? I know many women. I know many women who stand taller than their husbands. <laughs> Yes, as Muslims. No, oh, yes. That's rubbish. <laughs> well, then why did he send 124,000 prophets all as men? We ask those who follow the Jal, the feminist movement, could you kindly answer us? Do you have an answer? When Allah appointed 
imams. Imam is a ruler. Your imam is your ruler. Your imam is your amir. Amir. Okay? Whether you choose to call the amir Madam President, like Benazir Bhutto, or Madam Prime Minister, whatever you choose, you know, Imam is a ruler. The Imam is the one who rules. And Imam and Amir are synonymous. And when Allah used the term Imam for the first time, He used it for a man. He used it for Ibrahim alayhi salam. And He said, Inni ja'iluka linnasi imama. I hereby appoint you as the Imam of all of mankind. And then he asked, and Alhamdulillah that he asked, so we know the definition of Imam. He asked, will there be Imams from amongst my seed as well? Women Zuriyati? And the answer in parenthesis was yes, but not amongst those of your seed who are zalim. So now we look at the seed of Ibrahim alayhi salam to see if there were any imams who were women. And we find none. The imams who came from Ibrahim alayhi salam were all men. And so not only the prophets were men, but the Imams or the rulers were men. And so we have a philosophy of gender in Islam which is emerging very clear, very plain and very clear. Who leads the Salat in prayer? Well, of course, New York is a different thing. So let, <laughs> let's not bother. Or New York. Who leads the Salat in prayer? The Imam does. And who stands behind the Imam? The Hadith is still there in Sahih Muslim. Who it is who, lead, who leads the Salat in the Masjid? The Imam. And who stands behind the Imam? The hadith is still there in Sahih Muslim. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said that when the women go down in sijda, in salat, in the masjid, when the women go down in sijda, they must remain in sijda longer than the men. Why? Because, he said, some of the men may not have enough cloth to cover themselves properly. And if a woman were to raise her head too quickly, it would be an unwelcome sight. Most women have never heard this hadith today first time they're hearing it what this hadith indicates number one is that women must be allowed to come to the masjid they have the choice and for you to tell me we don't have enough space in the masjid on the day of Juma, so no women are allowed my answer to you is shame on you you have enough money to build the Twin Towers. But you can't build a masjid big enough that my sisters and my daughters can come and perform Salat in the masjid. Shame on you. I know you're not supposed to talk like that to the Malay people. <coughs> but if I hit hard enough, maybe tomorrow they'll hear me. Number two, that when women come to the masjid, they must pray behind the men. Behind the men. 
This is Islam. Islam didn't come from New York. It came from Allah and his messenger. And Allah and his messenger put the woman behind the men. He didn't put the woman in a balcony. He didn't put the woman in the basement. He didn't put the woman in an annex. He didn't put the woman behind a barrier. There was no shortage of cloth in Medina. No. So men and women prayed in the same space. With the woman praying behind the men. He said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. And this hadith is still there in Sahih Muslim. But you never hear it anymore. He says, the best row for the men is the first row. And the one with the greatest danger is the last row. Why? Is there some, something in the back row? And he said the best row for the woman is the last row. And the one with the greatest danger, the word used is shar, shar, evil, is the first row. Why? Answer, as the masjid fills, the last row of the men will be coming closer and closer to the first row of the woman. And this physical proximity, this closeness, is where the sparks can fly. There's the danger. Hmm? Good. So, women pray behind the men. Is this discriminatory? What's going to happen if you put the woman in front of the men? Ask any man and he will tell you, including Imran, who said, we won't be able to pray. <laughs> None of us will be able to pray, including Haji Ibrahim. <laughs> Women are beautiful. Men are attracted to women. And that's what nature ordained it to be. We don't want that to change. So if you put the woman in front of men, nobody could be praying to Allah, we'll be concentrating on the woman. Simple answer. Why is it that they can't understand that? What's wrong with their understanding? They want to know why not men on one side and women on the other side. Even if you put a woman at the side, instead of the front, we still be distracted, we are men. We are men. So the safest place to put the woman is behind the men where we can't see them. This is Allah's wisdom. It is not discriminatory to women. When a child is born, we have Akika. Allah's messenger said, if it's a boy, you sacrifice two. And if it's a girl, you sacrifice one. Is this discriminatory to women? Or is there a philosophy of gender that is emerging full-blown? When evidence has to be given, you must have two male witnesses, two male witnesses. It is when you do not have two male witnesses that you can have one male and two females. This is not just for financial transactions. If you believe that, buy a one-way ticket to the moon. What kind of intellectual acumen is that? To say that this law is specific to financial transactions. What is there in the law of evidence in a financial transaction that is different from the law of evidence 
on matters that do not pertain to finance. Is this the sum total of your intellectual acumen? Shame on you. <laughs> well then, is it discriminatory to women? The law of evidence? Or is there a philosophy of gender that is being presented to us so that we could understand what is gender in order for us to understand the foundation of marriage? Hmm? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam and we know he's the first to be created kullukum min Adam he then said that from Adam alayhi salam he created his mate, his spouse and we know who it was it was a woman, not a man so in New York they talk about Adam and Steve we say no it's Adam and Eve and Allah said to both of them Adam alayhi salam and his wife now Zawja his wife Hawa alayhi salam to live in Jannah to live in Jannah so now we know that there are two kinds of marriages did you hear that? There are marriages which are contracted there. And when Allah contracts a marriage, He doesn't need to have two witnesses. <laughs> when Allah contracts a marriage, He doesn't have to ask you, do you agree to marry Him? <laughs> no. Innama amruhu. So the first marriage took place there. And so marriages can take place there and marriages can take place here. And when a marriage takes place there, it is the divine wisdom at work. And the first marriage was between a man and a woman hmm? and then he said uskun anta wa zawjukal jannah and so marriage was meant for paradise marriage was meant for paradise so if you are married and your life is a living hell <laughs> something is wrong with that marriage because marriage is meant for Jannah and it kula minha ragadan haithu shi'tuma eat and drink and enjoy yourselves in Jannah and so marriage is meant for Jannah and after judgment day when Allah blesses you and I inshallah if we have forgiven our sins then we and our wives will be reunited in Jannah and when we are reunited in Jannah the description that is given is a description of companionship rather than physical union companionship that you will be sitting with her and you'll be looking at each other and you'll be reclining on couches hmm? and so marriage not only belongs to heaven but marriage is supposed to give us peace and contentment and happiness when it is the male and the female in Surah Al-Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further describes that peace of heaven, that peace of Jannah that you get in marriage. 
ومن آياته and amongst his signs is this أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها and amongst his signs is this that he created for you from amongst your very selves he created your wives, your mates, your spouses لتسكنوا إليها that you might dwell with them in a state of sukun what is sukun? there are things in life that money cannot buy of course the investment bankers in Manhattan will dispute that but there are things in life that money cannot buy and sukun is certainly one of them what is sukun? sukun is peace sukun is contentment sukun is tranquility your heart is in a state of sukun and that sukun therefore is a taste of jannah that this is what marriage is supposed to deliver so if you're not yet married come on get married quickly come on and get married quickly hmm? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now proceeds having sent them out of Jannah to live on earth that you must now follow my guidance for imma yatiyannakum minni huda my guidance will come to you the male and the female for imma yatiyannakum minni huda for man tabiya hudaya fala khawfun alayhim wala hum yahzanun if you follow my guidance you will come to no grief you will know no pain what is that guidance? in Surah An-Nisa again now we come to the understanding of the philosophy of gender in Islam as it impacts upon marriage you do not quote this verse of the Quran in isolation <laughs> no. you got to take this verse of the Quran and put it into context which is what we're doing yes I know that there is a historical event which occurred which is connected to the revelation but leave that historical mo event for the time being the asbab al tanzil Allah says in Surah An-Nisa Ar-Rijal Qawwamuna Al An-Nisa that men in their relationship with women men have something called Qawwam Qama Yaqumu Qawwam what is this Qawwam it can best be understood Qawwam in the context of functions that's the best way to understand Qawwam men must maintain women and so you cannot marry unless you have the capacity to maintain if you do not have the capacity to maintain you can still marry provided she has the capacity and she offers it to you as in a very famous incident <laughs> the marriage proposal came he said I can't afford and then she asked well what about if that problem could be solved he said who could it be? Khadija but if 
we look at the normal state, it is only when a man has the capacity to maintain that he can marry. Boys don't have that capacity. <laughs> Not only must a boy become a man, barig, but more than that, having become barig, he must be able to earn a livelihood, to be able to maintain a wife and the children who are going to be born. Good. But Kawam is not only to maintain, Kawam is also to guard and to protect. When um, I lived for 10 years in New York, and I noticed something over there that an American woman can be walking on the street and you know the mini skirts and so on, they're fond of. And men would be teasing her and whistling and you know. And some men may even pass that limit. And she might even find herself being touched and pushed and so on. And people would be passing by and nobody would come to her help. No. You on your own, baby. <laughs> this is the modern age. <laughs> but I also noticed that in Brooklyn, where the African Americans are, nobody dares to do that to a Muslim woman. Not in Brooklyn. Because if you make the mistake to harass a Muslim woman, the Muslim men of Brooklyn will give you a lesson you will never forget. Yeah. Don't believe me? Go Brooklyn and see. So <laughs> men must guard and protect women and of course children. It is in this context, this context, that men have a function related to gender. A function related to gender. A function of maintaining. And maintenance means work. And Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا And the night symbolizes libas and the day symbolizes work to earn your livelihood. And in Surah to Layl of the Quran, he builds an analogy between the night and the day and the male and the female. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى إِنَّ سَعَيَكُمْ لَشَتَّى And by the night and that which it shrouds and covers, libas, so mysteriously, with such splendor. And by the day and its bright light for work, for toil, for earning your livelihood. وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنثَى That in the same way that I created the day and the night, so too did I create the male and the female. Inna sa'ayakum lashatta. You are functionally different. Full stop. The philosophy of gender in Islam is now explained. That Allah created the male and female with no superiority or inferiority. Forget that rubbish. Allah created the male and the female the way he created the night and the day. Inna sa'ayakum lashatta You are functionally different. 
And it is because he wants us to respect the functional difference between the male and the female and not change it and not allow the Jal to change it. When the Jal says, how many women do you have in the cabinet? How many women do you have as judges? How many generals in the army are women? Have you heard the Jal? Have you heard the Jal? How many women in parliament? Did you hear the Jal? How many women in executive positions? Did you hear that, John? Let them go their way. And let us go our way. Regardless of how many choose to follow that, John. We don't want to follow him. No. Mankind has a choice today. When you study Akhir zaman Islamic eschatology, then you will understand that the choice before mankind today is either following Allah and his messenger or following Dajjal. There's no other choice. And so because, because men are functionally different from women, men have different functions to perform, functions connected with the day, with the outside world, with the public life, functions connected with guarding and protecting that Allah has made it obligatory on women to be obedient to their husbands or to their guardians. This obedience to your husband, obedience to your husband and obedience to your father does not, does not signify that he is superior than you are in Allah's sight. It is like a nuclear plant. Suppose the Malaysian government chooses, very sensibly so, eh, to build a nuclear plant in Johor Bahru. And to enter the nuclear plant, you have to have a pass. And there are guards at the gate. The chief nuclear scientist comes one night at midnight. He forgot his past at home. He says to the guard, let me in. God says, Tabule. No, sir. Show me your past. He cannot show his past. God said, you cannot enter. Does that make the God superior to the nuclear scientist? Huh? If you say the God is now superior to the nuclear scientist, you should buy a one-way ticket to the moon. <laughs> no, the God has a job to do. And in order for him to do his job, the nuclear scientist has to obey the God. So go back home and get your pass and come and then I'll let you in. I am the boss here. You not. See? So Allah has given to men a functional role to perform. And in order for men to perform that functional role, women must be obedient to their husbands to their fathers, to their guardians. What kind of obedience? Is this a blank check? No. Obedience to your husband in all matters which do not entail disobedience of Allah and his messenger. <laughs> the Jal now comes along and says, no, this is discriminatory to women. And so a modern feminist revolution comes which says that men and women are equal. What nonsense is that? We never put an equal sign between the male and the female. We're not that stupid. 
Whoever says that the sun, the day and the night are equal? Huh? The day and the night are equal? Don't you have any sense in your head? No, let us teach you the subject. Or you who have no knowledge. The day and the night are not equal to each other. The day and the night complement each other. Men and women are not equal to each other. Men and women complement each other. When will you understand? Hmm? And so, a philosophy of gender has emerged that is now under attack. A new philosophy of gender has emerged which says that men and women are equal to each other. And anything a man does, a woman should have the freedom to be able to do it. In the pursuit of the night, wanting to become day, well in Singapore the night is already day. In Malaysia the night is trying very hard to become day. But in Indonesia, I assure you, the night is still night. And if you see an Indonesian woman in a military uniform, oh, she looks so abzaki, she clumsy. She cannot wear a military uniform because she is still so much a woman. And so now, in order for the night to become day, Something happens to marriage. Remember, Wabatha min huma, rijalan kathiram wa nisa'a. That there is a functional role of marriage. Allah wants you to marry so you can have children. And when you have children, you have something called a family. And if you marry at the time that Allah wants you to marry as a girl, then your children will grow up and they will marry. And your grandchildren will be born. And they will grow up and marry. And your great-grandchildren will be born. And so you will have generation after generation in the same family. The intergenerational bond is essential for stability in the family because the elders are venerated and when grandpa or great-grandpa speaks, everybody down the line have to listen. So the government doesn't have to send the Ministry of Den Gender Affairs to teach us anything. Because we already have our ministry here. We have four generations in a family. The family comes into being and the family is the building block of society. If you attack the family, you are attacking the social order. The family, as it expands and becomes intergenerational, now expands in size. So larger and larger family. I, believe this still there in Terengganu. And that helps to keep wayward children in place. And so you have a certain discipline in the family. It's not just mommy and daddy anymore. It's a whole family. Straightening you up. Socializing you. But then you also have families joining together to make a tribe. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا 
Allah takes families and bring them together to make a tribe and the tribes come together to make a nation and so everything is bonded together based on the family which is based on marriage and if you change the relationship between the male and the female that the male has the responsibility to maintain the male has the responsibility to guard and to protect and the female has to be obedient to the male if you change this and you attack this eventually you're going to be living in a collapsing society look around the world today around the world today society is collapsing wherever Dajjal has succeeded in changing the rules of marriage now then who takes care of the children? parenting the mother's role is so important when a mother is a mother she performs a role that is so important that there is a dua in the Quran that I consider this to be like a divine role Rabbir Hamhuma Kama Rabbayani Sagira and so parents have a role similar to Rabb in respect to their children but the father has to be out toiling to earn his livelihood to maintain so then the mother has a very big role to play in upbringing of the child Rabbayani Sagira it is when she plays the role of mother successfully that we understand why Al-Jannatu Tahta Aqdami Ummahatikum When the Prophet said that Jannah lies at the feet of your mother he wasn't talking about part-time mothers He was not talking about part-time mothers Dajjal it is who says leave the home go out and get a career in the process of getting a career earning your livelihood now yes we know women are capable of doing that some of them can make better managers yeah we know women are intelligent no one is saying they don't have the intelligence but what's the price that you pay when you abandon your functional role when the night is no longer night who will take care of the children so part-time mothers now emerge in the jazz godless world and children are now neglected she has to go to work and the boss gave her only six weeks the baby is only six weeks old that's all and she has to leave the baby in a daycare center to go to work why? the child made me do it well I'm saying to you that you are neglecting your baby that's neglect and you're now a part-time mother and Jannan certainly does not lie at your feet anymore so I go to the baby and ask the baby and Allah allowed the baby to talk to me I, baby talked in English because I can't understand Bahasa so I ask the baby baby which do you prefer? prefer the daycare center or you prefer mommy? and the baby replied to me in English baby said mommy I want mommy 
Uh -huh. So guess what that baby is going to do to you when the baby grows up and the baby has to go to work. <laughs> baby says, I can't do anything else. The Dajjal has asked me to do this. I have to put you in a daycare center for old people. Huh? This is a collapse of society. When your old father and your old mother are put in a daycare center for old people, it looks to me like a junkyard of human beings. So I go to the old lady on a rocking chair and I spoke to her in English and Allah allowed her to speak to me in English. I don't understand Bahasa. So I said, Mama, Mama, do you prefer to be here or do you prefer the home with your son and your grandchildren? She said, take me home, take me home. This is punishment. This is the collapse of society. This is what has already come to those parts of the world that Dajjal has already changed. And this is coming to your part of the world as well. And you can't stop it. Why? Because there are lots of cattle in the world today. You can't stop it. Why? Because there are those who have eyes and yet cannot see. I hope you'll forgive me for this statement. Most of them are politicians. They're those who have eyes and yet cannot see. They have ears and yet cannot hear. They have hearts and yet do not understand. Ula'ika kal an'am, Allah says they're just like cattle. I can have them here in front of me. And they will listen to me and they will understand and they will accept that this is indeed the truth, but they will not, they will not follow it. Why? We have to submit to Dajjal. If we do not, we're going to lose our position. So they're all following Dajjal. It is because Allah wants the men to remain functionally men, fulfilling their functions as men in marriage that he chooses the masculine gender to describe himself. That he gives the angels masculine names. That he sent 124,000 prophets as men. That he appointed the imams as men. That the ami who leads the salat must always be a man. That a boy child, two animals, a girl, one. Under the law of evidence, because men have the experience of the public life. That's why. And when a woman is a woman, she would not have that exposure to the public life. When she does have that exposure to the public life, the price she pays is she's no longer truly a woman. Which brings us now to the last part of tonight's lecture. It's already so long, but we have not as yet covered the subject at all. There's so much more. We come now to the last part of the lecture. When Allah spoke of the male and the female as analogous, analogous, similar to the night and the day, we must now look at the night and the day to learn lessons about the male and the female. And when we look at the day, we notice that when the day is approaching the night, something happens. It's not business as usual, no. When the day is approaching the night, there is excitement. There is electricity in the air. This is the miracle of gender. That excitement of the male as he approaches the female. The, the day paints a colored 
colored sunset in the sky a riot of colors in the sky every sunset to tell you every sunset is a message to you that you must preserve this excitement you must preserve this electricity between the male and the female it is important to do it and when the day finally meets the night notice the sun plunges into the arms of the night like a ball of fire going down Allah is sending a message about the male-female relationship and woe unto you if you tamper with this and this is what Dajjal is attacking but you've got to study Akhirul Zaman you've got to study Akhirul Zaman Islamic eschatology to understand what's happening in the world today and when the night enters the day enters into the arms of the night notice what happens this is a time for rest and sleep there's a time for love there's a time for worship and then there's a time when you must say goodbye notice when the day wants to leave do you notice how the night holds on to the day the night does not want the day to leave all the riot of colors at the sunset is no longer there at sunrise the light now comes out little at a time at the time of dawn a little bit of light and then a little bit more and then a little bit more as the day is extracting himself from the arms of the night this is the intensity of desire between the male and the female but when a woman is naked in front of you the time will come and you'll pass by her with your you know the machine that you you see them tuck, 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 tuck. the palm computer everybody have so naked woman passing and you tuck, 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 tuck. you're going to work no big thing no big thing Nabi Muhammad said that Dajjal is going to do that he said women will dress and yet be naked we said Dajjal is already doing that and when women are dressed and yet naked eventually you're going to have a sexual revolution that sexual revolution is going to climax with the destruction of marriage marriage is for the birds he said people will have sexual intercourse in public like donkeys two days ago I got an email from an African student in Paris in fact he might listen to this lecture on YouTube two days from now this African student in Paris wrote to me to say to me Sheikh from my dormitory window of my university dormitory I just have to look out of the window and I can see people having sexual intercourse in public yeah meaning they will open they come to the balcony they'll open the louvers open everything no? so those on the opposite side just have to look across and you can see them having sexual intercourse where the public can see them this is where the Jal is leading today's feminist revolution the Prophet warned us about these things which are to happen and told us about the job 
we have the choice of following Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam or following Dajjal. If you follow Dajjal, then as women go out to work in the morning with a briefcase facing the traffic, you know the terrible traffic there is in KL. In the evening she comes home, she's very tired and sister don't be annoyed with me, I have a job to do, allow me to do it. When she goes to work, she cannot dress as a woman. No. Take a look at the outside world there you will see. She has to wear business clothes. So you will see her in a jacket. And you will see her in trousers, usually in a bank. And if you go to McDonald's, you will see her with a tie as well. Yeah. As you adopt the functional role of men in society, you now have to behave like a man. You got to speak like a man. Your voice has to become masculine. And in the end, your physical features are going to change. You're going to have a face that looks masculine. And men are not going to be attracted to you anymore, excuse me. A man wants a woman who is a woman. And as you lose your femininity, the day will no longer be attracted to the night. You don't believe me? Go down to Lower Manhattan. Go and see what's happening in Lower Manhattan. I lived in New York for 10 years. And when the day is no longer attracted to the night, welcome to the world of Adam and Steve. Welcome to the world of Adam and Steve. The modern feminist revolution from Dajjal is leading us to Adam and Steve. To end the lecture, we have to add only one more thing. And this is not the end of the subject, remember. This is only the end of today's lecture. As the night pursues the effort to become day, not only does woman lose her femininity, but also she has to delay marriage. So she's not going to get married at 14 anymore. Only those who take guidance from Allah will marry at 14. Those who take guidance from Dajjal will say no. And so now she postpones marriage and postpones marriage and postpones marriage. And when she does get married, Every man wants to have a child. And sister, if you can't have a baby, he's going to look for somebody else. But she can't have a baby. Because not only has she lost her femininity, but she's also losing her fertility. And so now she's got to go to the fertility clinics and when the fertility clinics can't do anything then you turn to something else so that the man can have his own child you'll turn to an Indonesian woman who is now a slave that's what they are when you pay your Indonesian maid who is my daughter she's my daughter She's Haji Ibrahim's daughter. She's the daughter of all of you here. When you pay our daughter a wage that no woman in Singapore will work for, huh? you're paying her a slave wage. 
a slave wage. And so you become a slave master <laughs> and wait until you go in your grave and then you see what Allah will do with you for oppressing. Because Islam has zero tolerance for oppression. Islam has zero tolerance for oppression. So now because you are losing fertility, you have to turn to surrogate parenting. But surrogate parenting in the United States is too expensive. An American woman will charge you $70,000 to rent a womb. It's rent a womb, eh? Rent a womb. But the Indonesian woman is a slave. <laughs> so you can pay her peanuts. And so she goes to the fertility center and the egg is fertilized. Hmm? And she becomes pregnant with your husband's baby. So during these nine months of pregnancy, she's got to drink. Hey, listen, make sure it's mineral water. Eh? Mineral. You got a first class baby inside there, eh? remember? Mineral water. Don't drink the water that you all drink. And she has to eat uh, good food, not GM food. Eh? And when the baby is born, baby goes first class. And mama returns as a slave. 1400 years ago, Nabi Muhammad said, one of the signs of Akhil al-Zaban is that a slave woman will give birth to her mistress. And talid al amatu rabbataha. So I've not as yet completed the explanation. Because if it's a baby boy who is born, the baby boy will not rule over his mother. But if it's a baby girl who is born, the baby girl will rule over her mother. Why? Why? Because there's something else at work. He said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam about Akhir zaman that one man will have to maintain 50 women. Not marry, eh? maintain. Why? There's only one explanation. That there will be a catastrophic decline in the birth of baby boys. So it will be a world filled with women. And therefore with your election system, women will rule the world. Madam Prime Minister. And then they'll ask, how many men do you have in your cabinet? <laughs> Can't you find any men to be judges? <laughs> Can't you find any men to be generals in the army? We need more men in the army. <laughs> Women will rule the world with your system, your political system. What is it that's going to cause the decline? Catastrophic decline. A medical doctor in Canada explained to us that the male and the female chromosomes in the sperm. There are male and female chromosomes in the sperm. And when the male chromosome does not fertilize the egg, then the default is a female. So if a baby boy is not born, then the default will be a baby girl. He said that the radiation from cellular phones and the radiation from your laptop computers. Notice where the laptop computer sits. And also the effect, the negative effect of genetically modified food has the impact of weakening sperm production. And in the process, weakening the male chromosome to such an extent that eventually the male chromosome will be too weak to fertilize the egg. And so baby girls are going to be born. Hmm? And when that happens then, 
a slave woman will give birth to her mistress. What we've done tonight, it took some time to do it, is to take you on a tour to explain the philosophy of gender in Islam, perhaps for the first time in your life you've heard it. And then arising out of our ex explanation of the philosophy of gender in Islam, to then turn to explain marriage. And to then end with an expl explanation of the functional role of the male and the female in marriage and in society. In the process of making this explanation, we pointed out that Dajjal is in control of the world today. And Dajjal is attacking this and attempting to turn it upside down. And so around the world today, we live in a collapsing society. How do we respond? There are only two choices. If you do not follow Allah and His Messenger, you're going to be following Dajjal. We pray that Allah may protect us from the fitna of Dajjal. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim wa tu alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawab rahim barahmatika ya ahmur rahim. Ameen. What is the significance of the year 2012? When the enemy starts to beat the drums on something, I know that I have to read behind, between the lines. And they've been beating the drums on 2012 for a number of years now. And that cannot be by accident. My understanding, and when I give my opinion, remember, I can be wrong. And when I give my opinion, no one should accept my opinion unless and until you are convinced that I am correct. That is respect for your own intellect. I believe that they have chosen 2012 as the timing, the countdown for the transfer of power from the United States to Israel. And so the collapse of the U.S. economy, the collapse of the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. economy and the U.S. dollar are now in hospital, in the ICU ward. So death is close. Hmm? And Israel then launching her big wars. Why does Israel have to launch these big wars? You've got to read this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, to understand. Why does Israel want to rule the world? This is around the corner. So I believe that 2012, the drum beating, is to prepare mankind for these dramatic things. So when the 2012 comes, they would not disappoint mankind because mankind is psychologically prepared for dramatic events in 2012. We are facing with men who are not functioning as Kawam Nisa. Instead, they take over the role and we are friending the family and community. How do we solve this problem? Okay. When men abandon their functions, then women have to take over and perform the function of both the men and the women. This has happened in North America because of slavery. Slavery not only destroyed the family, but slavery destroyed the male destabilized the male so that the men who were freed could not function responsibly as husbands and fathers and so the african-american woman and we have we have african-americans in this gathering here they could probably explain the subject much better than i can the african-american woman has had to function as father and as mother. But she did not abandon her role as mother. <laughs> no. 
because she did not abandon her role as mother, the children still grew up and they grew up stable. What the child does is he causes the woman to abandon her role as a mother and to assume the male role. Hmm? We have our way of dealing with delinquent men. I don't know what Dajjal has in his society, but ours is to retreat to the remote countryside and build communities, micro communities. And in these micro communities, we establish Islam. You want to see what is Islam? Don't go to KLCC, come to us. Don't go to the New Straits Times, come to us. And here you will see what is Islam. Because in our kampung, any man, any man who becomes crooked is not maintaining his wife and children or his wives and children. The kampung will take action against him. He'll become an outcast. So we will have a social system to ensure that our men remain responsible as fathers and as husbands. Mm -hmm. Shri Mbrana, why do we see second marriage is the Sunnah? Allah commands us marry two, three, four, and you can't be just then take only one. This subject will be for the next lecture on marriage. <laughs> I could not take up today. I could not. We started at 8 o'clock, we stopped at almost 10. So I could not take up the whole subject. So plural marriages will be for another day. I could not take up the age of marriage for a girl. I took up for the age of marriage for a boy. But the age of marriage for a girl is critically important. Because the elections are going to be held in Egypt soon. Ikhwan is going to win the election. Everybody in Washington knows that. Yeah? Washington is supporting the Ikhwan now. <laughs> and when Ikhwan wins the election, Ikhwan is going to enforce Sharia. Because Washington will tell him, enforce the Sharia. And like cattle, like cattle, they follow. And when they enforce the Sharia, then a Egyptian family will come forward to the Sharia court with a daughter who is six years of age and with a man who is 55 and ask for nikah. And the Sharia court will rule that it is Jais. And then CNN and Al Jazeera, you know their sisters, CNN Al, Al Jazeera, and all the television stations in the world are going to capture that marriage of a 55-year-old man with a six-year-old girl and Muslims are going to become the laughing stock of the whole world. Many Muslims are going to leave Islam tomorrow because of this subject. The age of marriage in Islam, but I couldn't take up that subject today. That's another lecture, inshallah. In Surah Al-Kahf, they fled to a cave. Nabi Muhammad said the time will come when a man, in order to preserve his faith, would have to flee to the mountain sides where rain falls and take with him some sheep and goats. I know many politicians will criticize Nabi Muhammad for that. But we have not as yet reached that stage for most of us. So I have said, if you remain in Dajjal's social order, you're going to destroy your faith and your family. You have to get out of his embrace. In order to get out of his embrace, for example, you've got to stop using this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper currency. Paper money is haram. And if anybody defers with me on paper money, I say, no problem. No problem. You can have your opinion and I have my opinion. We go our way. 
You say it's halal, I say it's haram, okay, no problem. But if you want to come after me with boxing gloves, and you want to stop me from preaching on this subject, I have a warning for you. If you are so convinced that this paper money is halal, I have a warning for you. And through this microphone and through this lecture, I take the, send the warning around the world. If you want to stop me from preaching that this paper money is haram, then I say, come. If you have the courage to do it, come. Come and let us both raise our hands and pray to Allah to curse with an eternal curse and to punish with eternal punishment whosoever of us is wrong on this subject. If you have the courage, come. Because I have studied my subject. And this is not an empty tin talking. This is a man who has studied his subject. He knows what he's talking about. So if we want to get out of the grip of the job, we've got to stop using this paper money. And we have to return to the money which is in the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the dinar and dirham. I don't think you can do that in KLCC. You can try. <laughs> I say it's possible in the remote countryside, in Kampung. And what's the definition of a Kampung with me? A Kampung is a Kampung when you cannot use a cell phone. That's a Kampung. Men hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. They are your clothing, your garments. And you are their clothing, their garments. When last did you leave your home to go out without putting on clothes? Huh? Did you ever forget to put on your clothes and go to work? No. You and your clothing are inseparable. Huh? And so while Islam has not made marriage obligatory, Allah and his messenger have used language close to that. And nikah is full, amen. Marriage is half of the faith. A man without a wife, a woman without a husband, is like the night without day. And so we must do everything we can possibly do, unless there is a valid excuse. Unless there is a valid excuse. We must do everything we can possibly do to make sure you put on clothes. Hmm? Make sure you are married. And so we say about our Muslim kampung that every woman who comes to the kampung and who says, I would like to get married, somebody has to marry her. Somebody has to marry her. And so marriage is not only for pleasure, marriage is also something that is compassionate, seeking Allah's pleasure. That I marry you for Allah's pleasure. I don't need to take another wife. I'm happy as I am. But you need a husband. So I will sacrifice the present happiness that I have with my wife. And I will marry you to seek Allah's pleasure. So that no woman who comes to our kampung and who wants to have a husband will be without a husband. And therefore every man who can marry will have to marry. 
if you do not have the means to maintain then of course you cannot marry but once you have the means to put roti chanai on the table <laughs>